are you? Do you see me? Am I really the apple of your eye? To have a relationship with the person, you have to know basically what they're like. And did you know that God has been misrepresented? And sad to say, a lot of that misrepresentation comes from the Bible. Not that the Bible is wrong, but the way it has been interpreted. We're going to share some things with you that will help you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I want to welcome some new stations to our network. Today, we are beginning our broadcast on KCAL. That's uh, TV9 in Los Angeles. And I'm really excited about being on there and reaching all of these new people available to this program. Also, WTWB TV 20 in Greensboro, High Point, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We started on that station uh, last week. Four weeks ago, we started on Harrisburg, Lancaster, and York, Pennsylvania, WGCB. And we want to welcome all of those stations to our growing network of the gospel truth. Real quickly, let me just say that I started on... Uh, radio in 1976. That would have been 30 years ago. And then in 2000, January of 2000, we started our television ministry. And right now, we're just close to 50% coverage of the entire U.S. 50% of all households in the United States can now receive this program. And also, we have uh, four different satellite coverage that basically blanket the world. We have coverage on any place, on any continent on the earth. And I'm excited because we're getting out the nearly too good to be true news that Jesus loves us disproportional or regardless of our performance. Now, that is a very simple statement, but did you know it's a statement that flies in the face of religion today? Most of religion today is saying that you have to earn God's favor. And there's all variations of this. Some people will preach that you get saved by grace, but then you have to earn God's favor as far as getting a prayer, answer to prayer and things like this. But most religion teaches a very performance-based relationship, and that's really not good news because you cannot ever earn God's favor. Your own heart is going to condemn you and tell you that you fall short. And if you buy into this thing that God loves you proportional to how you deserve to be loved, then you're never going to have a very positive relationship with God. But the actual gospel, the nearly too good to be true news, is that God loves us independent of our performance. It's totally by the grace of God. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't live a holy life, but we live a holy life as a fruit of and not a root of salvation. Holiness isn't a way to obtain relationship with God, but holiness is a byproduct of relationship with God. And that, in a nutshell, is kind of the heart of what God has given me to share with people. And that may sound very simple, but it's profound, and it is just radically, radically different than what people are hearing today. And that's the reason I believe that God has raised me in this ministry up is to get this nearly too good to be true news out that God loves you in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And I've been teaching on this. This summer, we've had some very powerful teaching. This teaching that I did on the war is over, that God isn't angry with mankind anymore, and that all of his wrath was placed upon his son and that sin is really not an issue between God and man anymore. Now, see, again, for those of you that may be new to this program, you may think this is heresy, but it's not heresy. What I'm saying is that God's wrath against our sin has been placed upon Jesus. And he didn't pay for it just in part, but he paid for it so completely that God is not angry anymore. The war is over. And God isn't imputing or holding people's sins against them. I've done a number of teachings on that this summer, and I tell you, people are getting set free. We've had some tremendous response to this. But what I want to begin to teach on today 
is from a teaching that I've entitled The True Nature of God. And what this is all about is, you know, for a person to have a relationship with you, they basically have to evaluate kind of what you're like. If you're just a mean, angry, hateful person, did you know that people make an evaluation? It isn't always conscious, but they're just constantly evaluating. And if they see that you're a certain type of person, they're either drawn to you or repulsed by you. They, they base their relationship with you basically on how they perceive you to be. And if they perceive you incorrectly, well, then that's going to affect a way that a person has relationship with you. I believe that every one of us have probably experienced this. We've had somebody misrepresent us or say something. People get a wrong impression, and then they get to know you, and all of a sudden they find out that's not who you were, and, and things just change. You know, I remember a minister's uh, group right here in Colorado Springs that I used to go to every Tuesday, and we just all got together, and we ate breakfast, and we prayed for each other, and we took turns, people sharing things. And anyway, there was this one man... Uh, here in Colorado Springs, who we used to sit together, and I just knew him as Steve. He knew me as Andrew, and we became friends over a year or two period of time, and we became really good friends and uh, just had a great relationship with each other. Well, one day I walked into that minister's group, and I was wearing one of my uh, jackets, and it had Andrew Womack Ministries written on it. And when I walked in, I sat down across the table from this guy, and this guy's face just turned totally white, and he looked at me, and he says, you, you can't be Andrew Womack, and I said, well, sure, and so I, he never knew my last name, and he says, oh, please tell me it's not true, and I said, what's the matter, and he says, I grew up in Southern California, I was a part of a certain denomination, they used to take your tapes and use them and play them in our school to show what a cult is. And he says, I have told hundreds or thousands of people that you are of the devil. I've actually had people burn your books and tapes and do all of these things. And he says, my God, I'm friends with you now. <laughs> and this guy was just panicking. And of course, you know, he went ahead with uh, what he knew about me and stuff, and we are still good friends to this day. But what I'm saying is, see, that's an, that's an illustration that if you have been, uh, if, let's just say, for instance, God has been misrepresented, which I believe he has by religion, and we've been told that he's an angry, vengeful, hateful God that is sending hurricanes and tornadoes and causing people to die and striking people with sickness and disease and he's ready to judge people. If that's the impression that you have of God, did you know it's going to affect your relationship? This man that I was telling you about, he would have never, never allowed himself to open up his heart and have relationship with me if he would have just let those prejudices, if he would have known what my last name was, he never would have uh, evaluated me on his own. He would have taken these prejudices and they would have influenced his uh, relationship with me. And what I'm saying is we've been prejudiced against God. And there has been a lot of misrepresentation of God. And here's a statement that is going to absolutely shock some of you. But you know where most of this misrepresentation comes from? It's from the Bible. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I believe in the Bible 100%. I believe it is the infallible Word of God. But I believe that there is an Old Testament way of God dealing with mankind, and there is a New Testament way of God dealing with mankind. They are not the same. They are two different covenants. And God revealed a harshness and a wrath in the Old Testament that gave people an impression. It was actually a wrong impression. And this is what this whole teaching that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks is all about. This teaching is going to be showing that God has always been, by nature, a God of love and mercy. And God has been kind towards people. That is the dominant, overriding characteristic and nature of God. Now, does that mean that God doesn't have any justice in him and that he can't punish sin? No, that's not what that means. Matter of fact, 
because he is a just holy God, he has vented his wrath on sin, and he's been very harsh on sin at times, and that is primarily recorded in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, God placed all of his wrath against sin upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and now the wrath and the justice of God has been satisfied, and today we are experiencing the true nature of God, this unconditional uh, love of God that is totally not proportional to our performance. It is now available to us. And if you don't understand the difference between the way that things were under the old covenant with the way that they are under the new covenant, then you are going to have a wrong perception of the nature of God. And it's going to uh, affect and hinder your relationship with God. So that's what I'm beginning to teach on is the true nature of God. I am not saying that part of the Bible has passed away, that it's no longer for us. There is still tremendous benefit and things to learn through studying the Old Covenant. But I am saying we aren't under the Old Covenant, that we have a better covenant that was established upon better promises, and today we have access to God in a way that an Old Testament man never could have access to God. And because of it, there are liberties and freedoms available to us in Christ that the Old Covenant person didn't know, and I believe that the average Christian today doesn't know because they don't have an understanding of the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. They don't have an understanding of why God was harsh on sin and how that now He can be totally different because He has been harsh with His own Son and placed our judgment upon Him. And most people do not understand this. They've mixed all of this together and they've come up with a wrong impression of the true nature and character of God. What's God really like? You know, you can't just sit down and, and come up with your own impression of this. You can't base it on only your own experience because you could misunderstand, misinterpret things that happen. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about right before we get into these scriptures on this. But you know, there was an instance where I had some friends of mine that were going to give me these two horses. Now, I've loved horses. I've had horses most of my life. I already had a couple of horses. And these were two um, uh, mares that had been, they were three years old, but when they were born, they were just turned out to pasture. And they had halters put on them when they were yearlings. But they had been free for three years. Nobody had touched them. Nobody had done anything to them. They put food out for them, but they wouldn't let you get close enough to them to touch them. And uh, they were basically wild horses. And because they had these halters put on them when they were yearlings, as they grew, the halter was now constricting the growth of their muzzle, and it was going to start deforming the horse, and uh, it could have actually killed the horse. Plus, the people who offered to give me these horses were moving and they only had one week left uh, by the time I actually caught these horses. They only had one week left before they were going to have to call somebody just to shoot these horses and put them down. So really, it was a matter of survival for these horses. But when these people offered me these horses, I really wanted the horses. So I paid these two cowboys $350 per horse to go catch the horses, break them, and deliver them to me. Well, they tried for two different weekends to catch these horses, and these cowboys couldn't do it. One of them wound up in the hospital because of some injuries he got trying to catch these horses, and they gave me my money back, and they said, it's not worth it. So anyway, here we were just one week away from these people actually being gone from this property. They were either going to have to have me get the horses, or they were going to have to put them down. And so I prayed about it. It's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing, but the Lord showed me how to catch these horses. And the horse would eat out of a bucket, and it would stick its head down in this bucket. So I got a big old five-gallon bucket that when the horse stuck its head down in there, you know, its eyes couldn't really see what was going on. And I put a very stiff lariat, uh, nylon rope around that, covered it up with dirt and leaves and grass and things. And I stood about 10 feet away, and the horses let you get that close, but they wouldn't let you touch them. I put those oats out there, and for a couple of days, I fed them doing that. And then one day, as they had their head in this bucket, I just flipped this rope over, and it uh, caught it around the neck. And when this horse felt that, 
I mean, the horse's name was El Shaddai. The people that gave me the horse, that's what they had named it. It's a name for God that means more than enough. And I tell you what, this horse was more than enough. <laughs> this horse, when it felt that rope go over its neck, boom, it took off at a dead run. I mean, just as fast as it could go. And normally that would have broken the rope, but for some reason this rope held. I had a railroad tie that I had sunk in the middle of the pasture and had the rope tied around it. And this rope held, and that horse just ran and it flipped it over on its back and it landed on its back, all four legs right straight up in the air. And when that happened, even though this horse was named El Shaddai, I believe it was demon-possessed. I mean, I have never seen fear and fury out of anything the way I saw out of that horse. That horse began to start picking and pitching and bucking and running in circles. My wife and I were watching this, and it honestly scared me. I thought this horse was going to kill itself, and I got a knife, and I started going and cut the rope loose, but this horse was so wild that it, I just couldn't get close to it. And so anyway, we watched for 20 or 30 minutes, and this horse ran until it literally just had no more energy. And this horse got as far away from uh, that railroad tie where this rope was tied. It pulled just as hard as it could, and it was in a uh, uh, lasso type thing, a noose. It tightened down on its neck, and this horse just passed out and fell on the ground. And so when it did, I went up and sat on its head, put a new halter on it, tied it up in between these two railroad ties. And did you know that that horse was broken? You could get on that horse, you could touch it. That horse would let you do anything. I could get on it. would do anything I wanted it to. Now, before I go on with this story, this, I've got a point for telling this story, but let me just make an apology here to all of you horse lovers. I know some of you are going to be mad at me and say, you should never treat a horse like that. I didn't know that this horse was going to do that. I, this was ignorance on my part. I love horses. When I saw how it responded, I would never tell anybody to do this. I'm just telling you, this is what happened. And so please give me some grace and mercy. I don't do this on a regular basis. It was a one-time thing, and it was a mistake on my part. But here's my point. Did you know after that time, that horse... It, could be, it was an Arabian mare, and it was a beautiful horse. And it could be standing in a pasture with its head up, and it was just a beautiful horse. But it would see my pickup driving down the road, and that horse would put its head down, its ears back, and it would just go to quivering all over. I mean, that horse, when I got around, it would just shake. It was in so much fear. This horse got a totally wrong impression of me through something that I did. I did it. I caught that horse, and I'm sure that that horse just thought that I was out to kill it, and that, it, I mean, this traumatic experience, it was the results of something I did. But you know what? That horse didn't have the understanding to recognize that actually I saved its life by doing this. Within a week, they were going to kill that horse if I hadn't caught it. Now, it was a desperate measure. It may not have been the best way. You know, somebody else that knew more about horses might have been able to do it better than what I did, but I'm saying I actually saved this horse's life. It was an act of mercy on that horse. But from the horse's perspective, it thought that I was just about to kill that horse every time, and it just was afraid of me, and it would do whatever I said, but it did it out of fear. And that horse, I mean, it was embarrassing. That horse would see me and literally go to trembling. When it had a saddle on it, that horse would tremble so much <laughs> that you could hear the saddle rattling and things like that. And so here's my point in telling that story. That horse had an impression of what I was really like that was wrong. I really am not a bad guy. I really don't treat horses badly. I am not a mean guy. I'm a nice guy. Actually, I used to go out to that horse and try and calm it down. I'd talk to it. I'd pray over it in tongues. I sang to this horse. I'd brush this horse, trying to convince it that I'm a nice guy and that I'm here to help it. But you know what? That horse never did, I don't think, get over that impression of me. And so here's my application. In the Old Covenant, the Lord judged sin and did things that people have interpreted to be that this is the nature of God. God is an angry, mean, harsh God. And so today they credit God with all the tsunamis and earthquakes and 
uh, hurricanes and all of the disaster, and they say God is the one that's striking people with cancer, and God's the one that does these negative things. And they got that idea because there are times that God has done things that were very harsh, and they just assumed that this was the true nature of God. But as we go through this study, I'm going to show you a lot of scriptures, and I'm going to show you that, no, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, I believe it's verse 8, says God is love. That is who God is. God is a God of love. And yes, he may have done some harsh things, just like sometimes we correct our children and you have to give them a spanking. You know, at the moment, the child may be absolutely convinced that you are a mean, harsh, terrible parent because you hit them. But you did that. You gave them a small consequence to keep them from having this huge consequence that could have destroyed their life. Just like I caught that horse, and yes, it was traumatic for that horse. Actually, I didn't make that traumatic for that horse. All I did was rope that horse. The horse is the one that did this to itself. It was its rebellion against what I had done that caused all of these problems. Likewise, God has done some things that have been very harsh, but as a whole, it's an act of mercy on the human race, trying to limit and restrain the amount of sin and stop the evildoers that are going in the earth. And under the old covenant, there was a harsh manifestation of God's judgment. But in the new covenant, there is a t completely different way of God dealing with sin. You know, this is a little bit off the subject, but this may help some of you and answer a question. But some of you that have really studied the Bible, did you know in the Old Testament, when the Lord told the Israelis to go in and conquer the promised land, he told them to kill all of the men, all of the women, all of the children, all of the animals, not to let anything that breathed live. Did you know that by our standards today, people look at that and think, man, that's brutal. That's harsh. Now, how could a loving God command something like that? Here's the reason. Under the old covenant, people couldn't be born again. People couldn't be changed. They couldn't have a life-transforming experience. All they could do is kind of deal with the external, but they were by nature a child of the devil, and the new birth hadn't come to pass yet. And so here in a nutshell, I'm just about out of time. I'm going to have to say this quickly. But in a nutshell, the reason God commanded total annihilation of popula populations is because they couldn't be changed. And the corruption that was in them was so vile, it was like a cancer or something in our body. And sometimes, you know, like if you have an infection or something, they'll amputate your foot or cut off an arm. And that's a terrible judgment on that individual part of the body. But on the body as a whole, it's actually an act of mercy because what you're trying to do is to keep that poison from spreading throughout your whole body. Well, these nations that were so totally given to the devil couldn't be born again and they couldn't be changed in their nature. And God literally had to bring judgment on them, which you could say, that's terrible, it's harsh. It was certainly harsh on them, but on the human race as a whole, it was like cutting out a poison, a cancer that could have spread and then defiled the entire uh, human race. So anyway, this is what we're going to be talking about, and I'll be sharing a lot more on this as we continue this series on the true nature of God.